Sage, welcome to come and nerd out with me on Shaga hey, Mushroom. Mason, always happy to join in on, on a nerd session. Hey, I'm um, from New York, right? Yeah, so normally I'm in LA, but I'm in New York at the moment. So um, bringing the big city vibes. Awesome, man. Yeah, I'm in small city vibes here from Byron Bay. It's a nice gloomy one here. So, um, hey, day, any day. <laughs> <laughs> so I think kind of Shaga mushrooms kind of, I don't know where you're at with it, but it was basically one of the first mushrooms I got onto. It was probably the one I loved Reishi from the beginning, but Shaga had my heart even uh, before Reishi. Um, I think we've shared a couple of Shaga teas, like right back in the day when we were first meeting. Yeah. Where, what's your history with this mushy? Uh, well, starting with the present moment, I'm drinking it right now. Sweet. Felt like it was, you know, the appropriate occasion. Mm. Um, I let's see. I first started drinking chaga maybe it's probably old, like eight or nine years ago, something like that. Yeah. Um, and I was actually, I was, I, I had it a couple times when I was living in America in like my late teens, um, and, and I was starting to learn about it, but hadn't really gotten high quality stuff or, or proper potency to experience it. Uh, and then I was actually I was living in Western Australia and. I was learning more and more about it. I was like, geez, well, I gotta get into this. And so mm. ordered a, a five kilo bag from Mountain Rose Herbs of the Chunks and had a heck of a time trying to get it through Australian customs. I, I did you get it into on Chaga a bit now. Did but you get it into time, Australia? Yeah, it, it got it through. Um, we, I was shipping that through uh, and, and somehow that made it. It took like months to clear customs. Um, mm. They let it through, which was, Pretty surprising. Well, that's weird because like, that was the same. When I, when I was first getting into this, I was at university in my last year when I was studying herbalism instead of business. And I, Shaga was that one. You know, you, I think you know what it's like. With every tonic herb, you kind of like go, you, you run through the list. Like we did an Ashwagandha podcast. And you, you know, at the end of it, you go like, holy shit, this, this herb's pretty wild. I better, I better be on this <laughs> one. Um, Shaga for me was the first one when I was reading all its benefits and really tripping out and kind of having that feeling like I need this in my life really quick and went down that same route. I just went and started um, ordering it from, from Croatia, from Finland, from, from Canada, um, from Siberia, and all of them got terminated because they were raw on entry. So that's why I'm uh, impressed. Maybe because you went from like Mountain Rose that are like actually reputable and mine had some like- Someone snuck through, like at the same time I was trying to ship through some hemp seeds and uh, you know, like a, a bag got through to a friend of mine, but mine got stopped and they said they would like arrest me if I tried to ship it through again. Um, but ah. that's, you know, Adventures of Australia, right? Uh, but at, you know, at the time I was dealing with a lot of Candida. Um, you know, folks who have listened to our Candida interview will, will kind of know this story, so I'll keep it brief. But um, I had a lot of antibiotics in my teen years um, that dealing with chronic acne. And I, I just, at the time, I didn't know any better. I didn't know how to approach this naturally, you know, balance my hormones and decrease carbohydrate consumption and decrease mm. sugar consumption and stuff like that. Um, so I had this candida going on and I, I hadn't wisened up to the, you know, the body ecology diet and cutting sugars out and some of the great antifungal herbs like Patty Arco and things like that. I was aware of a little bit, but I hadn't really taken the jump to, you know, properly cut out all fruits and sugars and carbs as, you, as can, you know, really make a big impact as you're, you know, in the stage one of, of dealing with candida. But I, you know, I got this chaga and I, I had a, a, a nut milk bag from the sprout man and mm. I would just, you know, put a handful of this in there and, and, and simmer it away in a, in a pot of water and make this dark, dark, dark brown drink that I just was falling in love with and was drinking it every day and was feeling so much better. My skin was better than it had been in a long time. Um, and that, yeah, that, the times in my life where I've been drinking lots of chaga, and it's something you know, I cycle on and off of, um, as we do with most of these herbs. Um, it's just, yeah, been some of the best feeling times of my life, the most robust feeling in terms of my overall health and vitality and immunity, I would say. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm the same. I mean, I eventually did get some in. I think I got in Alaskan Chaga that I ended up meeting the guy um, when I was there, I think, for the Longevity Conference when you were working. Um, this is the only one I've been Oh, to. I think I know who you're talking about. I've met him a couple of times. Yeah, he's like a big, woolly Alaskan man that looks like he yes. goes out. And, is his name Red, something like that? Something like that. He, like, he, he had like the highest antioxidant ORAC um, Chaga in the world, as he said. Um, right. But you know, Chaga was the, also the one where I was um, 
it was Shaga and Rishi when I kind of started tuning into a little bit of the wild crafting and DDAO conversation. That's when it was Shaga when I was trying um, scan, like I eventually got on the extract sampling of like Scandinavian is the only way to get into Australia. As you say, you know, it's been pasteurized and it's just, <laughs> it's just been extracted in hot water, which you want anyway. Um, so I was trying a bit from, you know, from Canada and um, up from um, in Scandinavia and then in Siberia and, and then eventually the Chiang Mai Chinese one as well. And that was like one of the first herbs that kind of tilted me in that direction. And like when I was like in the start of Super V. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to really look at China because that was like by far the one that like um, I was getting the best results with. But likewise, we boiling up that Alaskan shaga and just pumping it again and again and again and again because it's got such a delightful taste and it's so rich and you can, you can see the antioxidant medicine in it and you blend that up with the fats, um, you know, with the... Uh, you know, maybe like, you know, just like make a cappuccino and it's got that um, vanillin um, compound in it that gives it that little right. vanilla flavor and you whack the vanilla in. It's just like, it's such a delight. I've been doing it all this week. I've had, um, I've had Connecticut wild chaga. And so I've been just putting that on the boil with a heap of ginger because it's just been like flu season all around here. Mm. And I've had like a hectic couple of months. I'm like not feeling as robust as, you know, with like, alone time with the toddler and then looking after my mom and then, you know, in the business and then down for funerals. It's just been like full on. So I'm not feeling as robust as normal, but I've just been hitting ginger and shaga and far out. That's like one of my favorite teas, man, I've ever had. And then I'll layer in the shaga extract over on the top of that and blend that up into my little elixirs before I leave the house and just been smashing that all day. And I agree with you. I mean, it's like, it's one of those ones that you get onto it long-term and I've been cycling over the years and I'm back on hard now. Um, I mean, it's such a magic herb for just like annihilating cold and flu viruses um, and bacteria as well. That's like, that's what I like about it. It's a real good preventative herb, but it's a, um, it's a really aggressive one um, on oncoming infection stages as well as deep infection stages. But those times in my life when I've been doing shaga consistently, they've been, I feel like that's where I've been the most solid in my health. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. That solid is, is a great word to describe it. And you know, you talked about being antiviral. They've even shown um, in, in animal studies that it's very effective against hepatitis C. Um, so that's, you know, just a spectacular thing. Well, and, and like, I think clinically, um, there's a couple of good books now coming out about medicinal mushrooms, um, and clinical usage. And one of the, cons like, well, it's been years that they've been coming up, um, but consistently HIV keeps on coming up. I mean, HIV is a huge conversation. I don't think it's as black and white as everyone thinks it is, um, in terms of actually isolating that virus, but the effectiveness of the, um, eliminating the supposed HIV, which makes sense since what we're looking at is um, a viral infection, um, a retrovirus infection, and then absolutely no gut ecology and absolutely no immunity, which of course is going to lead to a suppressed immune system. And Shaga, I mean, I don't know if you think that, like, if I'm being like too fanciful by saying this, but in terms of an immunological herb or mushroom, I think like Shaga's like it's absolutely one of the best. And I know like on the internet, you know, it's like, this is the best and this is the best and this is the best. I think Shaga yeah. is absolutely one of the best things that you can do for your body if you have a suppressed immune system. Yeah, it, you know, it, I think it's right up there, you know, as, as it depends on the individual and, and what's going on with them. But I think, you know, it's right up there with like agaricus, maitake defraction, reishi, astragalus is like, you know, definitely one of the top ones if not the best and it of course it also is going to depend on where it's coming from how it's being grown you know is it wild crafted in an environment with extreme cold weather that's going to cause the chaga to produce certain uh, compounds as defense mechanisms against the cold that end up being then immunological tools for you mm -hmm. or is it uh you know chaga that's being grown on rice in a laboratory where it's not really getting those kinds of extreme temperatures and it's not uh, getting the compounds that it's really evolved to have out of the birch tree. Uh, so yeah. there's many levels. So, you know, some people may have tried, you know, some chaga capsules that they found at the health food store that are just grown on grain in the lab. Uh, that one, it could just be primarily grain that they're actually getting on the capsule. And, and even the chaga that's in there is not the chaga that nature has designed. 
Well, that's because I don't think the technology exists to grow Shaga DDAO. The DDAO Shaga of the world is wild. So it's going to be, it's going to be wild harvested. They don't have the technology to grow it on Dwanwood, on like Birch right. Dwanwood or whatever. Yeah. So it's right. going, if it, yeah, if it, yeah, if it's not wild, it's going to be grown on a grain um, substrate of some kind. I think that's a good point. Um, you want to go a little bit more? So yeah, as you said, like birch is its, um, is its preferred um, food or growing medium. Um, quite symbiotic. I mean, can be quite, it can be parasitic long-term to a birch tree, but there's birch out there that's been like sitting. Like, I know um, talking to the guy who harvests ours, um, ours on Chung Bai Mountain, um, and I think you source yours from, where, where's your, where do you source yours? Ours is coming from Siberia. Are you going to Siberia? From, uh, from Siberia, from uh, the, I don't know how you pronounce this one. Ir Irgusk, uh, Ir something, ah, uh, my Russian is not, <laughs> not happening right now, but Ir Irkutsk, I think it's called, um, yeah. the, the province there. But anyhow, yeah, so it's, you know, it's a, one of the most important things is that it's growing on birch. And then number two, that the temperature is getting as low as possible. Yeah, and super low. harvested at the right time of year as well, because if, if, if you're getting it at the wrong time of year before the weather has gotten cold, then mm. it's not going to have the same potency either. Well, that, and, and, and also just making sure that you're working with wild harvesters that just know their shit. I mean, the guy I was, um, I was rocking around with, he was saying like, you know, the trees are either going to be 20 years old, but a lot of the trees that is growing on are 80 years old and got conks on there that have been on it for like a lot of that time. But I know that Susan Weed, the herbalist, brought up in um, a, an interview she had with Tani. She was just like, you know, she, like, she heard that we were doing shaga in the middle of the interview. Um, she went on a little bit of a rant, um, you know, about how much of an unsustainable industry it is harvesting shaga and it was and then tani uh, like tani explained to her kind of like a little bit the difference between how the harvesting is happening in america and canada because that's something i've been watching for a long time um right. a long time i mean like you know eight years um it's why i kind of chose there's there, there's not much regulation but it's coming through right now and i have a friend who's like shaga harvesting business was shut down by his local um by his local government just because they were like we we're not getting permits out for this anymore, but there are a lot of people out there in the Canadian Shield. And when there's like, you know, a lot of two minute noodle businesses coming up and they just go out there and they just start harvesting shaga. And there's a very particular way to ensure that you're taking off a certain amount of that sclerosha to a certain extent, not almost like de-rooting that you're going to leave the birch and the mustard. You're going to grow back. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to get it growing back. And I, I did, I was like, I thought it was obvious, but you know, back in the day, but it's not. And, but in, um, in China, the the regulations and i'm not sure what it's like in siberia but i, I know siberia i had, like that's my backup plan for if i feel mm -hmm. chung Bai mountain gets um not sustainable which i'm confident it is now but um looking into siberia it seems to be one of the more well regulated shaga harvesting operations with like a, and it's got law it's just like young men um you know with scraggly beards you know wearing earth runners running around canada you know, <laughs> like going and harvesting with their with their um, unique trendy little harvesting knives, you know, rather than like the guys that have been doing it and passing it down in their family. That's not true across the board. There's obviously really wonderful people who are holding the tradition in America as well. But right, I, I know I know a really awesome guy with the scraggly beard who, who does that, and and he knows what he's doing in terms of the sustainability. But uh, there's definitely ones scraggly beards who are not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, I, and look, I have a scraggly beard as well. So all the love. Um, but that's the, like, that's kind of the thing in like, um, in through China, the regulations of the local governments are so gnarly and they've got, you know, and they, um, and they govern with an iron fist around the national park up there in Chiang Mai mountain. And so I just feel like that's worth kind of putting out there because I mean, I'm like, it's, it's still a wild west with the wild harvest, like wild harvesting of herbs a lot of the time. And a lot of it's hearsay. And I think in America, it's a real hearsay in terms of it being, you know, sustainably wild harvested. Um, Susan, we definitely thought that the um, harvesting scene in America had a lot to answer for. But um, yeah, so I put that out there. So as you said, getting it into the, getting it from those areas where the weather is gnarly and getting like, you know, huge negative temperatures when it comes to the winter is going to be create real robust birch, real robust shaga. And yeah, you want like you want like Wim Hof Shaga, basically. Wim Hof Shaga. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I gave him some shaga actually. Oh yeah. When, when he was in Malambimbi, I don't, I don't know because his um his partner is from Australia, and so they were they were down here. And, and one of the things I realized, I just dropped a bunch of herb on them just to like go on your way, like to you know happy to support that. And because I got her contact details, details, I'd have to write to her and just make sure Wim knows that shaga is the Wim Hof mushroom. He loves the cold. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so um i mean we've kind of we've kind of pointed to a little bit of like it's growing conditions where it grows um but you know especially like russia poland um baltic countries um you know right up through northern europe through the scandinavian countries through the canadian shield um and it's a huge traditional use usage going on which points us in the direction going back you know five thousand years in china you go back like European use going back 2,600, maybe 2,700 years, I think it is, um, in, in terms of written records of these things. So this is not something that's just been discovered or has no you know, historical use. This is no flax seed, which was turned from a, a clothing crop into a, you know, a food crop, you know, just decades yeah, ago. That's it. This is no kale that is just a hybrid from brassica. This is no celery, which is a human hybridized food in itself. This is an ancient wild food. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a different. It's a whole different kettle kind of fish. thing to be consuming. Yeah, it's a different kettle of fish. I mean, um, I mean, a lot of like I think a lot of the traditional usage comes from um, studying the. I think it's the Canty, the C H A N T Y um, populations. Mm -hmm. It's like the Siberian Russian. Um, they really hold it down. I think the on terms of um, folklore um, treatment, it really comes and shines with tuberculosis. Because I think it was it was one of those bacterial infections that was annihilating a lot of people, and once shaga kind of really started settling into its um, into the apothecary there, it and the word spread right around about its usage against tuberculosis, and it was really effective as an antibacterial in that sense. And and then stomach disorders and stomach infections and parasites. It's like this is the thing when you when you see a superstar emerge in traditional um, and indigenous populations. The reason these things become like the super herbs and superfoods of the times is because like you have a higher chance of dying and remaining sick if you didn't have this medicine in your life that happened to be insanely um, effective and then preventative. And that's why shaga has gone like, you know, um, it was just like so revered. And then as soon as you see, um, uh, gosh, with... Um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's, um, Solzhenitsyn's book, The Cancer Ward, come out in 1967 or something like that. I've got the quote here to, to read, but I think that's when it really boomed out from like being passed along the traditional, um, you know. Traditional yeah, that's when it became a whole global phenomenon of, of people really understanding that. And, and during the wars as well, it was often consumed in as a coffee replacement in Europe, interestingly. Well, that's in, that, I loved that fact. And like, the, how good yeah. is it? How good is that? You're in, in, in like, people's greatest time of need, Shaga was there. Absolutely. Shaga was there in the trenches, literally, with humanity, which is absolutely what you want. If you're in the trenches and it's cold and you're packed in like sardines and infections jumping from one human to the other, you don't want to be on coffee. You want to be on Shaga. And the fact that you, that, that, like, they had, what did they have access to? So many different things they would have had access to in an industrial way, but Shaga was what they chose to replace coffee, that dark, rich, you know, terpene, polysaccharide rich elixir. But um, the Solzhenitsyn's, um, I don't know if I'm um, pronouncing his name right, but um, as you said, Jordan Peterson would be proud of like, you know, us having, um, having these quotes rumbled in. The quotes, um, it's really poetic. Um, he could not imagine any greater joy than to go away into the woods for months on end to break off this shaga, crumble it, boil it up on a campfire, drink it and get well like an animal, to walk through the forest for months, to know no other care than to get better, just as a dog goes to search for some mysterious grass that will save him. And that kind of shows that there's this combination when it comes to herbal medicine that one, it is the herb itself. I know 
in a semi-autobiography in the book, I think, the, that, the Cancer Ward, Alexander's book there. Um, but the quote before this talking about how hard it was for him to get the information because everyone he knew who would be able to ask had died or moved away. And so he couldn't get this oh. knowledge makes me really, really grateful for just like we're living in this information age and we might not earn it as much sometimes. So we need to earn it in different ways. Our connection with the herb rather than trying to find those people like little pockets holding the wisdom. Right, it becomes so easily accessible. We don't have to go into the forest anymore, which has its upsides and downsides. We can get it more, you know, more easily and more often and more people will get it who never would have gone and found it. Yeah. But there's something to be said for that journey and that pilgrimage to get to it. Absolutely, because then then the placebo is activated because you have so much belief and you've gone and you know like that's what I kind of like the reality of you've you've thrown your hat in the ring with you know your healing intentions and you're willing you're to invest respond. You're invested rather than just like pure speculation because we've got too much to choose from these days, right? And we don't know. Like back then, obviously, in his world, Shaga rose to the top in the whispers behind the scene of how you could naturally heal cancer. Shaga has risen to be the top whisper and the one that carries the weight and the people that he trusted. So he intuitively knew that and went and found and invested himself. And he's combined um, the healing of the Shaga with being out there ensconced in nature, which is what a lot of people on healing journeys today need to replicate. That's getting the Shaga you know, it's couldn't be like, I've, you know, you've got it in chocolate. I've got it like sitting here in a mirror jar and with like an extract of wild chaga from Chiang Mai Mountain. I mean, it's so easy for you to get it that you need to replicate how you're going to throw your hat in the ring and really invest with, with creating um, a relationship with this herb and also making sure that your lifestyle is, is ensconced with like, you know, getting into nature and having that experience, that primal experience of getting out there and discovering what healing is for you, you know, to go out there like, a, you know, like some animal, <laughs> just this, try and search for this mysterious grass that will save you. Is the grass the shaga or is it the experience of being in nature? Is it a combination of all these things? Is it the alchemy of your lifestyle? And that's what people need, I feel like, you know, I think we talk about these herbs as you know, and I, you know, like, I think I'm, I get a little bit more excited about these herbs. They're like shaga for everyone, like a little bit more so than you. But th these caveats need to be thrown in for me so consistently, not only because it's responsible, but that's how you're going to get the best results of these shaga, of this, these herbs and shaga. Because you know it's got a particular place and it's got an appropriate usage to get the effectiveness. Absolutely. And it's so interesting to see, you know, there's a, a part in the, in the quote you mentioned about, you know, going out and, and walking in nature. And it's, it's a journey to get the chaga. And it's interesting how chaga also supports the physical body and endurance so much, like they've shown in studies with mice. And you know, kind of the common way they'll test uh, animal endurance in, in studies is they'll see how long they can swim for, which is. I, you know, I, I, I hope they're plucking them out of the water once they can't swim anymore. That would be what I hope. Um, uh, but, but they do show that uh, in, in studies with the mice that when they've had chaga, they're able to stay swimming significantly longer. And they've also found that it improves liver glycogen, which is really mm -hmm. pure fuel for the cells and for the muscles, and is also decreasing lactic acid. So in terms of an endurance food um, for, for athletes, but also for, for like hikers and backpackers. Um, it, it's so on point. Or a mum that has more than two children. <laughs> two, two. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 it doesn't have that, you know, to put it into a business sense, like it doesn't have like that branding around it when I think about it or my connection with it hasn't been there. But um, I mean, what I was saying before, when I was like, when I've been taking it long term and I feel solid and robust, far out, like exactly what you were saying, like recovery time. Increase. Yeah, yeah. Just so everybody knows, we didn't talk about that before this podcast. We, we that, that like we landed on the same description without any any previous conversation or practice. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, I mean, well, like it's good. Like it's it's always fun jumping in because I don't think we ever really prepare. But it's always I trust that you've got a relationship. I know that you've got a relationship and experience with the herb as I do, and it's nice to kind of dance around and see where our you know our experiences meet. So. Let's go. I'm like, well, I got to get back into like a little bit of the traditional usage. Um, the the usage around um, colitis, inflammatory bowel, um, digestive issues of all kinds. It seems to that and like you know, and even to an extent, stomach cancers. 
it seems to consistently come up in a traditional sense for these issues. Um, and looking at all the clinical guides, that's consistently what they're, you know, it's like whether it's Crohn's, whether it's colitis, um, whether it's leaky gut, um, you know, whether it's IBS. Shaga is one of these ones that has been used in protocols consistently. And I think a lot of that has to do, of course, all these beta glucans are always going to be really magic for the, um, for the um, indigenous bacterial populations. But I feel like it all comes down with Shaga, not all of it, but a lot of it, I'd like to get your two cents on, um, of course, antioxidant and superoxide dismutase content. Where it's got like, I don't know what it is, like 25% more superoxide dismutase than any other medicinal mushroom. Really high on that antioxidant score. In fact, what was it, the score again? 52,000 on the ORAC value score for Shaga. Oh, I had it pulled up earlier. I might have to go find that again, just so we can uh, get the exact well, number. I've got um, one source but, here for 52,000, but I'm not, I'm, and I'm always a bit skeptical about ORAC values because they can be used for branding. But I know that like across many different yeah, right. testing, um, across many different testing sources, um, Shaga remains like it's up there with like the dragon blood clove with like on being that highest antioxidant contain and unique. Yeah, in terms of other superfood things like acai, you just blows them away. Acai, please, please. please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I still love a good acai ice cream. If you hey, do it right, and sure free and. Nice one of the best thing, the one of my best moments of my else. life was yeah one of the best moments of my life stepping off Ipanema Beach and having an acai bowl back in like 2009 and going uh, and going gosh I think this would go off in Bondi <laughs> and I was like <laughs> I mean, it was like one of the like thousand people having the same thought at that time but. I feel like it's got a lot to do with that. You know, the, I can really feel it, um, you know, whether it's like reducing the lactic acid as well, for, you know, but like, you know, getting, getting an insane amount of free radical and antiviral antioxidants coming through the system, as well as the immune modulation. You already talked to the fact that it's one of the most adapt, well, you know, it's an, a, a heavily adaptogenic substance. It's going to like dramatically affect your endurance. Um, and I've been talking to, you know, I don't have the data on this, but talking to a lot of herbalists over the years, they see it has been up there with like gynostemma in terms of the most adaptogenic substance. I don't know if you've come, I've had that conversation mm -hmm. before. I definitely feel that for myself. I feel the most adaptable when I'm going, when I'm taking Shaga consistently on so many different levels. But then when you look at its regulatory capacity and its modulating capacity for the immune system, um, especially because it's not purely relying on the beta-glucan fraction, um, that, that polysaccharide fraction is so much immunologically going on within um, the, um, you know, with the betulinic acid and the um, triterpenes, um, more so than the others. I mean, like in all the clinical guides, it's like, yeah, immunologically, we really want, you know, I know we don't necessarily, like, necessarily agree with this. I know I don't. I think I've heard you speak about it before with reishi and all these kinds of things. Where they, you know, you really just want that polysaccharide count to be like up really high or just a water extract in order to get that immunological benefit. And with reishi, it seems, you know, important, but maybe not as important clinically to get the alcohols um, and um, the um, triterpenes in there to affect the immune system, modulate it. Um, although I think it is, and I think you do as well. But um, is that yeah okay good um but yeah, with yeah, yes and no i mean the, the water soluble fraction that gets the beta glucans which are way more water soluble then you get the triterpenes and things that are going to have more of the adaptogenic effect um well and, especially and like a nervous system. which you know will have a secondary benefit of immunity because obviously stress and immune health don't go together well yeah and, well and then what well, was exactly right like you know you're going to be working on the nervous system adapting the nervous system that's going to take stress off the body so the immune system can work well Whereas with the shaga, um, the, um, the ethanol extract is you know, bringing out compounds that are highly immunological, that are doing a lot, like a lot of the um, anti-tumor activity and studies have just been purely using uh, alcohol extracts. Not that that's like where it's ended up clinically, but it's been shown that the triterpene fat fractions and um, the betulin the betulinic acid in shaga is having a lot of a direct effect on the apoptosis of certain cancer cells, um, stopping the spreading, um, separating, so on and so forth. And also the, just like the, yeah, basically just like on where they've seen on contact with tumor cells, 
um, somewhat of a reduction. They're attributing that a lot of the time to the alcohol fraction. So it seems to be one of the more important mushrooms to get a dual extract in order to get direct if you're looking at getting direct immunological um, upgrades or healing, if you're dealing with something gnarly. Yeah, I think, um, you, you know, there, you have to look at all the different compounds that are active in there and figure out which ones are, are going to be, you know, strategic for your application and, and what you're dealing with. Um, it, what's interesting with the betulinic acid is it's actually not nearly as high in the chaga as it is in the birch bark. Um, yeah, so you can, right. if you like really want to go hardcore in betulinic acid, you can get betulinic acid extracted from birch bark uh, at a much higher level than you would get it from the chaga. Usually in chaga, it's around 1%, but it just speaks to the potency of it that at that level, um, it's able to be so efficacious. Um, and there's some chaga products out there that will do the chaga and then add, I think this is really cool, that will add the birch bark extract in additionally for the, the extra, extra synergy of the vegetalinic acid together. Um, and then you also have like these, these phytosterols, the, uh, and, and these are a lot of the antimicrobial kind of compounds. Um, you mentioned the superoxide dismutase, super high, melanin really high, which is actually one of the basically primary antioxidant there. And this is really unique to find in, in a mushroom or in a food of any kind. Um, well then, and then you, if you go down the route, not that I like talking about it too much, but the melanin connection with melatonin and the connection with the pineal gland. If you type in chaga and melanin, you'll get all these like how to activate your pineal gland blog posts just smashing your feed, which there is an association with like increasing the efficacy of the pineal gland. So I just thought I'd throw that out there as well because it's always a fun one to talk about in melanin, especially here in Byron Bay. You do a talk and you know, we like talk about all these magical things about chaga and I'm going to be listening and you go, you know, it's got a real, like, you know, it's got an association with um, assisting pineal. Um, and they go, oh shit, I'm going to start writing. <laughs> <laughs> and there's God. so much that is still left to be, you know, confirmed in, in terms of the pharmacokinetics of, of chaga and exactly how it's written in the body. Um, you know, it's still in the early days of scientific research. I it think, is. you know, you know, it's immune system activating, it's increasing interleukin-6, the lymphocytes, it, you know, you mentioned earlier that it's beneficial for ulcerative colitis. That's been shown in research and for bringing down inflammation. Um, and it's one of those ones that it's going to be super exciting to see as the light gets shown on it a little more over the next, you know, 10 or 20 years, what else emerges out of the research. And well, psoriasis keeps coming up in the research. Um, I think it was like first back in the 50s when it had inhuman trials with about... Um, 50, 50, so it's, you know, this is only you're on 50 people. So, but since then, it's, um, they've, they've taken that and, and uh, pr proven its efficacy in the pathways it's working on with psoriasis. It had something like insane, like 35% of, um, 35 out of 50 people went into remission. Um, and 70 were like, seven people, sorry, were like completely cleared um, of any signs. And it was about, they said about nine to 12 weeks was like for treatment that was like that that was at the point whether you're going to know whether it was going to be working or whether it's going to be effective yeah. or not um however then you start seeing on the cancer side of things they say you like it's been quite it's shown quite significantly that you need about 12 months usage at least before you're going to start getting like you know start seeing real um tumor reduction size if it's effective for you and i don't really feel the, the call to go into it because there is a particular extracts types particular cancers that it has efficacy for in different dosage it's going to be you know we can talk a little bit about it but just you know yeah, it's been sure. specifically shown i believe to have the most research area is for liver cell cancer it's been shown to really help um stop the the growth of the cancer cells there i think that's the one that the research has primarily been on yeah i mean and um prostate and colon are coming through um in the mammary glands as well um has been researched quite heavily and i think up and coming is especially various types of lung cancers but that's very you know that can that can vary quite a lot but you know i think it's, it's an important one to get your integrative practitioner like aware of chaga and like you know pulling the data up but um, i think with the psoriasis you know being such an um, anti-inflammatory herb it's um working on t-cell um regulation so regulating the t like the t helper cell um balance which is, you know, comes in and shows yes with most inflammatory conditions and then leading on to autoimmune conditions. It's always, you're always going to see that medicinal mushrooms are going to generally work on that pathway in order to get those results. And that's what they're attributing a lot of the um, psoriasis action to as well. And it's coming at it in two directions, right? It's working on the gut health and it's working on the immune system at the same time. So And the gut. It doesn't get much better than that. The gut, like, oh, uh, sorry, the, the caveat I needed to put in there was with the, um, um, with the psoriasis, it was... Um, conditions where there was 
um, microbial um, upset or my, like a like sorry like a a, a gastrointestinal illness going along at the same time in conjunction with the psoriasis. So that's like, that's that caveat. Um, you know, it was like constipation or diarrhea or reflux or something occurring in combination with that psoriasis when it gets really effective. But I don't know if we talked about it too much in when we back and did our gut podcast, but if I could go back, I'd be talking a lot about chaga um, in there. And then, I mean, just on the potentiation of the immune system, I mean, is there like, is there much you, you want to jump into there? Any cool, like any fun, cool little facts? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, it's increasing interleukin-6, T lymphocytes. Um, it's, you know, it's got these long-chain polysaccharides, these beta-glucans that, you know, you probably heard us talk about with reishi and, and astragalus and, and so many other of these great medicinal mushrooms that are basically in, an education for your immune system. They're giving your immune system more tools to work with. It's like an operating system upgrade for your mm. immunity. Mm. Um, so this is great. I mean, now you always want to be cautious dealing with, like, if you're an autoimmune patient, um, a lot of people benefit from things like reishi and things like chaga in autoimmune situations, but not everybody. So that's, you know, if, if you're dealing with some form of autoimmunity, you want to, and, and you're interested in experimenting with medicinal mushrooms, you're going to do that closely observed by a practitioner. And that's one, it, it's one of the cool things. If you can get a practitioner working with you, especially if you've got a full-time job or kids or something like that, and your full-time job isn't healing yourself and responsibly regulating yourself i think that's kind of like people get confused about why some people can go and like take it into their hands it's because they have time <laughs> basically they've got time um but if you're working with someone that can measure your antibodies as you start including something like this in a clinical setting that's the i think we've spoken about it quite a bit it's one of the reasons i'm quite comfortable talking about mushrooms and autoimmunity now but there was like four years where i wasn't mm -hmm. because i had so many practitioners coming in to me and finding me to talk about the fact that they'd used herbs like um, lion's mane, cordyceps, chaga, and reishi specifically, and turkey tail in autoimmune yeah. conditions. And across the board, um, in just these examples, I know it does exist, though I assume it exists, is they'd never had um, it cause any more damage. They'd only seen it not work. That was like the worst. That they okay, were so it's either it's going to do nothing or it's going to be beneficial in their experience. Well, that's, that was like, you know, I probably had like a conversation with about 100 practitioners now that whether they'd... Wow whether they measured the antibodies or not, a lot, much smaller amount measured the antibodies, but a lot of them were just observing their patient. Yeah. And that was, that's across the board. I've never had it. I've never had anyone say anything. And then this was with responsible dosing, you know, from an extract perspective, you know, starting at quarter teaspoon. If you go up quarter teaspoon morning and afternoon and very, very, very slowly increasing in that sense. But I mean, if you start getting into the the areas of the immune system that you start seeing modulated, um, you start seeing enhanced, you start basically you rattling off most of the immune system from <laughs> from what I can um, from what I can get to. But yeah, it's um, and then real quickly while we're on while we're on kind of the areas to be careful around um, with with diabetes and if you're also taking blood thinners it can improve those situations too much. It can lower your blood sugar to where your, your diabetic medication would then end up taking you too low. Same with blood thinners, your blood can get too thin. So you gotta really be careful there as well. Um, and if you either have a penicillin allergy or if you are taking penicillin-based drugs, uh, there can be um, a, a bad interaction with chaga. So yeah, those are just some you know, rare cases that we just gotta cover. I, you're in Australia, I don't know how it is there. Here in America, everybody's got their lawyer on speed dial. So I just like to always make sure we cover those. I mean, we don't have lawyers on speed dial, but we try and do it. We try and like talk people off the ledge more so yeah. than try and talk them into taking more. And that's a good, I mean, that's it. like, it's one of those interesting things. It's like, you know, it's like with, I actually won't, I won't use that example. Let's just keep it on Chaga because I might, might just, it's a little bit too, can, you know, convoluted. But Chaga, there in diabetes you can see ah yeah like if you if people come like i have diabetes which herb is going to help it's like all right before we go into that and say look we you know clinically you're going to be using chaga for blood sugar regulation and also as a pancreas spleen toner i mean we'll get into this a little bit in terms of what it's toning in the chinese perspective but it's very effective as well as like if you are on blood thinners but you want to start doing it naturally. So you start taking like fish oils or, you know, like you start taking ginkgo to get some circulation or reishi or whatever it is, or purifying with shaga mushroom. You need to be ready to adapt 
that's one of the great things if you're going to be getting, be getting into like taking adaptogens, you need to get ready to have your finger on the pulse and adapt your lifestyle and your medications and your other supplements and all those things because these things don't muck around. They do work. And this the, it's an interesting one with tonic herbs, as you know, medicinal mushrooms because the, the, like the, the Western branding around them is like, these are herbs you can take every day. And they are gentle. And traditionally, 2,000 years ago, they are classified as those that are gentle enough when you're in the preventative world and you're just trying to enhance your life, you can include them in your diet. Now, nowhere does it say you have to take them every day. Um, you know, they, you don't take kale every day. You know, you don't necessarily take quinoa every day. They're a part of your diet and they're circulated. But you the, haven't met the health food population of California yet. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's that's true. The kale, the kale chip phenomenon is still going strong, and I never, I still never forget when I was driving up the five and it was a drought five years ago in California and it was this green wonderland. It was like this oasis of green. Kale as far as I can see, huh? I was like, what is that? And it was kale with all these sprinklers going <laughs> in the middle of like the worst drought that California had seen in years. And I was like, screw you, kale. But um, I think it's always just it, like people got to realize these herbs are going to work. If you don't have the time or if you feel like, and you know, to, to put it bluntly, if you don't have the skill to watch and measure the effect that these are taking, if you're in that position where you're just happen to be taking what your doctor is giving you or what your naturopath is giving you and not really investing, then if you are all of a sudden going to turn around and start bringing it upon yourself to bring own herbs and supplements into your diet, you need to get invested then in understanding and just observing, because all it takes is observation, it's pure science, the changes that it's making and then cross-correlating it over to your other things that you're taking and learning when it's time to adjust. Because you only have so much of a cup and you start filling it up, it's going to start running over. You need to know what's, you know, what's causing the holes, what's causing it to fill up too much, too fast. So, um, and basically what you said, if you're taking blood thinners, just make sure you're watching it because chaga works. These herbs bloody. Yeah, if you work. combine, you know, powerful herbs with drugs that are not dual directional, they're moving things in, in one direction, one direction only, and your doctor has calculated that dose based on where your, you know, blood glucose regulation was, and that is going to change. Well, then the drugs going to need to change. So you got to be really in, in communication with your doctor about these things, and they may need to monitor you more closely. Well, and as well, the doctors aren't really counting on those markers ever going down. Right. Like, it's like, great. You as far know, as they know, nothing can change it. Nothing can change it. It's like, great. And they're like, like you know, they even preventatively put you on these things. So, yeah, you definitely got to make sure you're getting onto, um, you know, just like keeping your finger on the pulse of that. Um, I mean, anything on like, you know, anything else immunologically you want to talk about? I mean, like I've always like, I'm just like pull up. Pull up well, you were talking uh, just briefly, you mentioned um, that it's, it can be classified as a splink tonic. And that's another area where it, it kind of correlates with modern science in that it's been found to increase uh, spleen lymphocytes. So that's, you know, it's activated immunity within the spleen as well. So that's uh, very cool to see. It's always great to see these awesome alignments between the traditional knowledge and wisdom. Um, and, and who knows how they figured some of this stuff out back in the day. And, I know, and it's so good. Now with the, the, you know, the highest technologies. I mean, and again, like, and going through it, just so everyone can kind of get an understanding in terms of deficiency that, that occurring with Shaga mushroom, remembering we're talking about beta glucans and very unique fungal beta glucans here. And so we're working on those receptors within the body, um, like Dectin 1, um, the complement receptors, um, toll like receptors. And that's where that's, this is the turning the lights of the immune system. And that's both, both adaptive and innate immunity. So down when you, when, you know, as, as you were saying, we're working on the spleens, we have very particular, you know, we can go through a range then from like, whether it's spleen, whether it's lymph, whether it's glandular, we look at specifically with Chaga, um, we've got interleukins, uh, um, natural killer cells, interferon, um, macrophages, um, B, T lymphocytes, um, uh, what was the uh, tumor? Why am I having a mind blank? Um, you know, I'm the, the tumor regulating? No, it's, I've lost it. But just like down the line. Tumor necrosis factor? Yeah, tumor necrosis factor. That's it. Um, you know, we're like, and we're especially, but that like not, not as directly because we, when you look at the, when you look at the um, betulinic acid having a direct effect on the immune system and tumor, 
Um, when you look at the, the other side of Shaga with, with, um, with its beta glucans, we're looking at it like, you know, it's, it's got an up, upstream effect on these, um, the tumor necrosis factor, um, on the lymphocytes, on the um, uh, granulocytes, you know, these kinds of like, you know, these infection fighting cells, you know, that like even like, you know, getting in there within, the, um, you know, tumor infin, um, infiltrating lymphocytes, you know, these kinds of things, we're looking at an upstream effect as well as then hitting an alcohol um, extracted substance, which is directly working on the outside of getting in and hitting that tumor. So that's where we start seeing like, you know, across the board, you know, you start seeing it like that conch, um, that, that sclerotium, you know, the, the shaga mushroom, which, you know, in fact, there's like a study to show that like the, the sclerotium is like, you know, not the fruiting body, what, what emerges from the tree. It's not like reishi, that it's a, that's the fruiting body with shaga but there's like really only 10 percent that they can purely identify as fun fungal dna and the rest of it's a bit of a mystery to them um which is oh, i find very exciting and as you were saying with and the shaga, mention that it's also worth mentioning real quick that you know yeah. chaga has layers to it and the the bechelin and bechelinic acid that you find in chaga is concentrated in that outer black layer which is the worst tasting it's the more intensely bitter and, and slightly acrid. Um, yeah. Yeah, keep on going. Sorry for the silence, everyone. I just oh, went okay. away to get some shaga. I... Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah, oh, perfect example. Yes, so in that black section there, that's where you're getting the, the bechelin. And as I said, it's also concentrated in the, in the bark of the birch tree. Uh, yeah, so and you so got, a lot you of people have... will sell chaga that does not contain that black section because it's going to taste gentler um but that's where some of the real good stuff's at well you like so you some of you people will be watching this video but most of you will just be listening so you can go to the show notes or just go to like you can go to the super feast um instagram i'll have pictures of shaga up sage has has got a video on his, on his instagram tv making shaga tea we'll put that in the show notes as well but you you can see that on the on the underside we're going to see um that um you know that core of the of the mushroom conch the sclerotium and then that black burnt charcoal bark on the outside and as you're saying for some reason um you know just when or maybe i know the reason when you're trying to um create um a specific chemical ratio that is more correlated to your product um your your market or you know, you're trying to create a product that's more specifically high in a particular compound, whatever the intention, I, I don't get into that kind of convoluted world when it comes to product. I want the whole mushroom and I want to crumble the whole thing up and that includes the bark, it includes everything in there that can possibly be beautifully preventative and potentiating for the system and then high pressure cook that in both um, water. And this, this is the thing, if you get shaga raw, and you just infuse that and you just put it in hot water, you'll get some pigment. You're not getting, this has clinically been shown, you're not getting any of the anti-cancer compounds. You're not getting any, any, anything that's going to get in there and um, uh, really help you become super adaptable. You need to like five hour cook that shaga. Um, and we've spoken a lot about that process. You can then get that shaga up. You've cooked it five hours, pour off that water, take the, um, the mark mushroom there in a little bit of water, put that in the freezer, freeze it, the water expands within the cells, cracks open that mushroom, you get it back in, you're gonna start, you know, make another tea, you're gonna start getting a lot more pigment coming out so you know that you're getting medicine out. That's kind of like, that's why we are really happy to be using high pressure extraction when it comes to shaga with water and organic ethanol so that we get in that whole conch and, you know, you, exact, I think it's a, like a similar process you're using with yours in the Siberian. Um, side of things to make sure that you're actually not selling anyone short because that's the most annoying thing when someone's like yeah i mean this stuff that we get from siberia comes so black it's incredible ah uh, it's great like it's the best thing about shaga it's just like that pitch black well yeah and then like so we look you know you start looking a little bit at the um the the tcm approach to it it's it's entering the kidneys it's entering the heart it's entering the liver and the spleen and then has a bit having a huge effect on the um, on the stomach at the same time. Um, slightly warming. It's why it's such a good winter um, medicinal mushroom. But um, you know, it's not warming in the sense that you know you you like astragalus is quite you know is is quite warming and has a particular energetic that it can start like locking infections in. So it's not necessarily 
when you have an infection, astragalus isn't the real time to take it. But with Chaga, even though um, it is a chi tonic, um, it doesn't have those same effects. In the middle of infection, it seems to be very effective at helping move on a cold, a cold and flu. But if you're burning up hot and anything's going to tip you over the line, you know, you, that's when you wouldn't be really using gingers or yeah, garlic. The peak of summer, it's, it's not necessary. There's, there's other options for it. Yeah, and then the, everyone, will, you'll notice that as well. You'll notice that you'll, you, know, you won't use as much sugar in the middle. Of, yeah, you'll lose a little bit of interest. Um, and the taste, slightly sweet, but mostly bitter as well. Um, so that's why that's a little bit of sweetness. You see me getting a security over to the spleen and digestive function to the stomach bitter, heavily working on that liver. And we, and traditionally, and in the modern clinical era, it's blood cleaner. Nothing cleans the, well, lots of things do, but in the traditional sense, nothing cleans the blood in that region better than Chaga. If you've got blood, um, if you've got, um, you know, blood poisoning, you know, if you've just like, you're generally feeling toxic, if you're sick, if you want to have a cleanup, it's why it's so great to use in conjunction with chemotherapy because it's so immunological as well. It keeps that immune system going. It's like with all these things, ashwagandha, reishi, shaga, you know, talk to your, your people. But that's why, you know, you can see there's, you know, there's um, studies emerging and, um, you know, with turkey tail as well, with the majority of the medicinal mushrooms in conjunction with chemotherapy being used because you don't want the chemotherapy to completely annihilate your immune system. You have something just generally, as well as your whole lifestyle and diet should, keeping your immune system aloft. At the, um, at the same time, looking at shaga, particularly in the cleanup from after you've been on hardcore medication or chemo and radiotherapy, this is a blood filter, filter wrap cleaner, liver tonic. It's a beautiful one. Amen. Jing Chi Shen. Um, wonderful Wei Chi tonic as well. So it's a great preventative tonic. And um, I mean, I'll just quickly go through, just like just pulled up, um, finally found <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I should have been looking at before this podcast. But um, the, the actions, the herbal actions, um, you know, in, in a clinical setting. So the, they're using it these days as an adaptogenic, of course, antioxidant, of course, antiviral, antibacterial, um, anti-inflammatory, um, immunomodulating and immune enhancer as a tonic. So, you know, if you are depleted, it's one of these herbs that, you know, is going to actually get in there and build you back up. Um, amazing for the skin, um, for the skin. So it's been used as a skin tonic and a liver tonic, especially if it's, um, you know, you can, do, do you do much um, application um, externally of Chaga? Um, I, one, one thing I do, uh, I don't do a lot, but one thing I do occasionally is if I'm doing, if I'm, I'm making a pot of chaga tea and that's going and I'm doing a clay mask, I'll use the chaga tea as the base of the clay mask. And first of all, it's amazing putting on a warm mask as opposed to a cold one. It feels like a million times better. Uh, and I'll do it with like a mix of uh, bentonite clay, French green clay, and reservoir clay. And yeah, I, I really enjoy using that topically in that way as well. It feels really nice. Yeah, nice. What, what I've been doing is I've been getting, so I've got, I've had an infusion of a whole lot of cacao butter and I've fused a bunch of chaga in, into the cacao butter and I've still got that uh -huh. going and I'll get that up on my face um, and I'll put that on ire. Like if anything erupts on me anywhere, I'm gonna, I'll get that out, I'll get that out there. I want that antifungal, antimicrobial aspect. Yeah, yeah. something, uh, you know, yeah, it's active topically on you getting, you know, a, a chaga extract on it. It's awesome. Magic. And that's, you know, like, and I don't really want to go down and like talk about cancer too much because I'm not ever insinuating that if you, if there's, if it's present that you should be using chaga as treatment, because that's not what I say, but like the, in terms of its skin protective ability, and especially through that melanin pigment that we we're talking about with so fondly when it comes to the pineal gland. Also, um, of course, melanin is what's, you know, present in the eyes and the skin is what's giving you that nice tan. And so that it's possibly a correlation. I haven't looked at it too much, but that's it's a it's a protector from radiation. So they say down here in Australia that skin cancers are national cancer, and I'm like, all right, that's such a crock of shit. But like at the at the same time, if that's the case, then shaga mushroom should become our national mushroom, even though it doesn't actually grow. Yeah, but just to kind of like everyone can read through the lines there. Um, it's also a magic expectorant as well, which I never really you know use it for. Um, but it's an um, anti-mutagenic and anti-diabetic um, herb. So we've kind, of, we've kind of covered that 
but just looking at like just going through a list of general indications just to make sure that everyone's kind of got this down pack um, you know as you probably can hear sage and i aren't really using it for this purpose we're using it for its potentiating ability it's in our diet but yeah just so like, you can, you know we're mainly using it for building this foundation of energy yeah. and the endurance and and just kind of the, the fun side of it rather than just the, know, fun the, the, the fun side fun side because we're fun guys and the but the practitioners listening you know or you know those of you just wanting to like have your own traditional usage present you know don't you know don't go all like you know like frontier on us with it you know always you know be responsible but it's good to know um cleaning the blood is the first general indication for chaga transforming mucus and so if you've got that kind of infection especially where you're um super mucusy that's where chaga is really beneficial whereas on the other side of it if you're really dry something like tremella might be a little bit more appropriate um calming the mind um reducing stress countering fatigue Supporting surface immunity, we chi, uh, psoriasis, inflammatory conditions, um, always for antioxidant support, regulating blood sugar, diabetes, treating fungal infections, um, you know, just basically bringing candida back in the balance most of the time. Um, is a potent antiviral, antibacterial, always, and then of course, gut health, IBS, Crohn's disease, and sleep. The active constituents are still being discovered. Um, I like the, you know, just the, a lot of focus on the triterpenes um, and the betulin. I think it was the 1955 in Russia that that betulinic acid um, extract was um, approved as an anti-cancer medicine. And wow. you, you see, and, and still, you know, still, you know, like being used for an anti-cancer medicine. I'm not exactly sure in the process, but from what I can understand, it's not unusual to be like, right, you have cancer. You know, we, we first thing we get you on these chaga betulinic, uh, betulin extracts, um, and then you know, and then maybe chemo at the same time. They're like, it's a, it's an in tandem kind of integrated integrated. Herb. Right. And so often people will ask, you know, is it safe to have chaga with chemo? And and all indications, and of course, review this with your doctor, but all indications point towards a synergistic effect. Yeah, all all of it, like it all comes back to syn um, like to these these medicinal mushrooms generally being synergistic. Um, so that's, you know, like generally is, like, is the key word there. But the, um, the lanisterol is something I think has been currently researched as an endocrine regulator because it's something that doesn't really get spoken about much. And we remember we did our podcast with Dan. Um, I don't remember which one actually, but he, he was saying he sees mushrooms as endocrine regulators. And Probably would have been the adrenal podcast. If of course. Wanted to go back and check it out. Yeah, of course. That um, and and I'm, and I was talking to him about like what directly is is you know what what is it directly in, that you see adapting the adrenals? And he was just like, look, nothing so much directly. It's just that it's so amazing for the immune system and nervous system. These mushrooms, nothing for him clinically comes close as like a holistic treatment so that the endocrine system can endogenously balance itself um it takes the weight off the adrenals right it takes the the fight or flight and the immediate threats away from an immunological perspective from an endurance perspective mm -hmm. um from, from you know from your energy expenditure whether that energy is being used for, you know diverted to your immune system to deal with inflammation to deal with viruses or microbial issues or whether you're you are low on energy and you're having to, you know, rely on your adrenals for whatever physical activities you're doing. Chaga will come in and support on both of those levels. So your adrenals can, you know, take a, a paid holiday. Yeah. Paid holiday. <laughs> Do you guys, how's, how's, how's your worker rights in the U S? Do you guys, are you guys getting good? Like, I know you're, you're dishing them out. You're the owner. Well, I run my own business, which means I, uh, you know, works, work, double time yeah you have not paid uh, weekends get paid get paid marginally but you know that's <laughs> <laughs> do you guys do you guys it's a good rights there and like for workers i don't think it is since like i've heard like, like not as much as australia no australia's rocking right like yeah well yeah we're, we're more shaga than america but um just in terms of like the the lanisterol i think it's going to be interesting to see what comes out in the next coming years about that thing you know so sophia who works here helping me just put together um herbal notes and herbal trainings for our team um she was like just scratching 
on the top of the, the emerging research and lanosterol, especially in the Shargum, been a great directly endocrine um, modulator, but was just like, there's not enough data. Right. Quite yeah, so much, much of this stuff we'll know more in, in, in five to 20 years, and that will be really exciting. And then we'll be able to say, I told you so. We told you so. We, 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 we knew all along that it was the best ever by far. Um, trace minerals as well. Um, pretty, right. pretty you've, got, you've got interest in them, like not even trace minerals, but almost like macro minerals, like you know, uh, zinc um, is, is quite high. Uh, calcium, bit of magnesium, I believe manganese, if I'm remembering correctly. Manganese is in there, selenium's in there. Um, yeah. Chromium, um, boron, and then... And the chromium probably plays a role in the blood sugar balancing effects too. Yeah, there you go. There's always an answer. Um, cop I think copper as well, not in high levels. But then lots of like really... Yeah, yeah I remember seeing that. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned ger germanium, um, which always makes... I think germanium, like there's like Rishi and Chaga. One of the reasons I think they're so magic is for the ger um, germanium content. Yeah, germanium is an interesting one. It's pretty exotic. It is exotic. That's always how I feel about it. <laughs> and then like... Um, I should have had a note on like it has very interesting trace minerals that don't have much of a brand around them. Um, antimony, um, barium, and bismuth. And I'm not sure what they do. <laughs> what are they doing for you? We got no idea. Back and that's with us in you know 20 years, and I'll tell you. <laughs> and that's yeah, and that's what it comes down to. I think a lot of the time is um, there's your with taking a tonic herb and a medicinal mushroom, there is so much going on um, and so much unidentified within these herbs. And obviously in a treatment setting, you know, you were talking about particular fractions of polysaccharides um, in maitake. You know, you can talk about the same with um, the PSP and PSK in, in um, turkey tail. You know, there might be particular cancers where it's so beyond a doubt that they are the most effective and proven to help with that particular cancer and in order to also get someone throwing their hat on the ring and what i say activate the placebo you need to use those because there's enough kind of like you know backing it behind it but right. the you know, if you mind when it's when it is is uh thinking positive thoughts is spectacular yeah exactly right and and, and, then and so, when, the, when the treatment fits into your belief system going in that direction Exactly. It helps to an extent, but that's why it's always nice to say malleable because that's like, you know, you're always going to be able to say adaptable and get it. You can always get better treatment protocols, I think, but always changing isn't benefit either. You sometimes it's nice to sit, sit somewhere and double down. But when it comes to potentiating, um, there's so much going on in sh these medicinal mushrooms, including shaga, that you're way better off getting like a compl the whole conch, the whole mushroom and getting that extracted basically how your ancestors would do it. You know, the, all the lore and the magic has emerged from your ancestors doing this. Sure, modern technologies are helping us, um, you know, extract in more potent ways, and that's really magic. But, you know, not getting too heady with it, you know, keeping that whole, you know, the whole holistic nature of all those constituents, you know, and especially doing it in a dual extract, um, you know, or like, you know, if you're just doing a tea and a water extract, long time boil. I think that's like one of the, the key points I want to send everyone away with, you know, don't overthink it. Remember, there's lots that we haven't identified yet, and you're never going to know it all. All right, sounds good to me. Anything else you want to leave everyone on with Shaga? No, I'm feeling very complete. I hope everyone will really enjoy it. Um, oh, you know, maybe one quick thing is you mentioned earlier briefly that it contains vanillin, which is, you know, also found in vanilla. So that makes a great flavor combination. So if you're making yourself a chaga tea, um, you know, it's also nice just to have it straight and experience the pure chaga flavor. Maybe you mm. want to make it into a smoothie, but it's also really nice, especially for a first timer. And if you're introducing it to a friend or relative who is not into healthy, earthy, bitter flavors, to add just a couple drops of a vanilla stevia that has a, a clean flavor profile. And those flavors go so well together. Um, mm. It makes it a really easy thing to get somebody started on. Yeah, I mean, even just like a whole vanilla bean and just scrape that straight in there. Like that yeah. alone can be enough to just activate that entire palate. And that's how I do. I mean, like, I feel like it was amazing with chocolate, especially when you got a little bit of vanilla in there. And if you get a little bit of pinch of, a little pinch of sea salt in there as well, yeah. you blend that up into a hot chocolate or make a chocolate. It has, that happens to be a magic combo. But with berries, always with blackberries and blueberries, if I was making up little smoothies or mushes, shaga, I always felt went better with berries than any other mushroom. Interesting. Like, yeah, I, and, as, and again, especially when you get the vanilla on there. But anyway, it's a magic mushy and I hope you all try it and love it and have wonderful days. And I hope you have a wonderful 
night there. My day's just starting over here. You have a good night. You go on, you're on outside of Friday night in New York? Friday night, we are just working. Um, working? You're not we're clubbing? on a mission here, getting herbs and chocolate out to the world. So that, yeah, we're going full power. Awesome, bro. Well, you have fun doing that. And thanks for joining me as always. Yeah, have a beautiful day. Enjoy all the, the beauty of Byron. I will.